Okay, record. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, I'm with Daniel Ingram. He is the author of Mastering Core Teachings of the Buddha, uh, which also is like a subtitle of an unusually hardcore Dharma book, something, something of that nature. Um, now, that book became really important to me. Um, but before I get into that, um, you're a, you were an emergency room doctor, but you retired, am I correct? Yep. Um, and now you focus on various um, uh, meditative and philanthropic and uh, sort of scientific projects, it looks like, trying to yeah. track down various things. Is that a pretty good representation of what you're up to? Sure. I helped to organize something called the Emergent Phenomenology Research Consortium. And that is dedicated to trying to bring a very balanced data um, based uh, understanding of the wide range of things that psychedelics, meditative experiences, and other things like that can cause. Um, and sometimes it can just happen to people in daily life, what a lot of people would call spiritual, mystical, magical, psychedelic, energetic, et cetera, phenomena. And we would call emergent phenomena, just labeling, you know, sort of putting them all together in one sort of general category, about which the clinical mainstream, I will claim, has a relatively unsophisticated understanding of. And we hope to give those who are practicing clinical medicine or mental health or even just people in the public a, a really good data-driven understanding of the phenomenology, um, reasonable diagnostic categories, how to cultivate more of the good stuff that, you know, in a scientifically validated way, hopefully, how to deal with the challenging effects and how to make good decisions about one's own practices based on just informed consent and having enough information to really thought, you know, think through the risk benefits and alternatives to however you're going to look at things, what you're going to do to yourself, how a clinician might handle a patient, et cetera. And so, so I'm also the acting CEO and board chairman currently of a charity called Emergence Benefactors, which is designed to raise the hundreds of millions of dollars that the EPRC project will take. Yeah, it seems to me that one of the things I've always liked about like uh, your story, I guess, um, is like it's really varied and you've got a sort of background, obviously, in medicine. But what's also interesting, and this is where I, where I became interested in your work, was um, you're obviously a very advanced meditator, but you've also, you also, uh, for me, uniquely, you, you've done ayahuasca and you've also, you're also um, quite uh, active magically. Um, that's where I sort of became interested. And I'll just give you my little backstory quickly, just so you know where I'm coming from, because that will tie into some of my questions here. Um, eight, nine years ago, I did ayahuasca. I did it for two years. It just seemed like I was really innocent, didn't know what was happening. Then all of a sudden, I started having demonic evocations every day, didn't know, like without taking anything. Wow, that was scary. Um, Can you describe what that was like? So maybe yeah. people who listen to the oh, podcast yeah. already have heard the story, but sure. I mean, uh, yeah, um, for me who well, haven't. What, uh, the first one manifest? was really surprising. The first one was really surprising. I was uh, visiting my mom uh, up at their house here in Chile, and uh, we're having a we had some dinner and we had a wee cup of tea, as we say in Scotland. And uh, we were having a cup of tea, and I was drinking quite a lot of caffeine. And we were watching a film. And as we we're watching the film, I suddenly became aware of a presence in the room, and I didn't know what it was. I could just feel something. And, I, and I'd never had this experience at the time. It was like, I mean, during ayahuasca ceremonies, you might feel this kind of thing, but you're all, you're also quite, um, uh, what's the word? You're, you, you're not anxious. You're quite, uh, you've got very low blood pressure during ayahuasca ceremony, right? You're not moving that much. Whereas here, I'm quite active. Anyway, I start feeling a presence and I'm like, what is that? And I don't, I'm, I just feel something. And I, I look over and I, I see something moving, which is almost, the way I describe this, do you remember that film Predator with Arnold Schwarzenegger? Uh, yeah. And you can see that you can see this thing running, but it's like a mirrored surface. It yeah, it's like kind of that. got like it's got a pretty good invisibility thing, but it's kind of glitchy. It's kind of like yeah. shimmery, sort of a little air distorting. Right. So I'm like, what is that? And for I don't know if I blinked or if I closed my eyes, but when I closed my eyes, I saw a demon, but it was a female. And it looked hmm. it looked almost exactly like Angelina Angelina Jolie in that film Maleficent with the big horns. Yeah. Wow! And uh, 
<laughs> I was like, what the blank? And um, it was getting closer and it was really horrifying. And it just wanted me, right? And it was and it was sexual too. It was it wasn't like being sexual, but it was this sort of because I mean it's a it, it's sort of like Angel Angelina Jolie esque yet demonic. So you you don't want anything to do with it, but it's trying to pull you into its spinning you into its sensual web of desire. I'm like, oh man. So I you know I'm obviously you know you start worrying about oh man I'm going crazy. Don't want to scare my mother. Although my mother actually went to, uh, she went to an ayahuasca ceremony with me at one point, which was, uh, wasn't a great experience for her, but she went. But um, I decided, I got up, I went to the bathroom, was splashing water in my face, and it came into the bathroom. And I'm like, and I, what I realized was that what I'm going to have to do here to break this spell is I'm going to have to be honest with my mother. Because I have to, if it's secret, I'm, you know, it's not going to work. So I went back. I said, hey, mommy, I don't want to say this to you, but like, uh, just so you know, something happened. I think there's a demon here. And my, <laughs> my mother's like, well, wait, wait here a second. That's fine. And she gets up. She walks back to her room. Now I'm like, I'm like shitting myself, you know, and she comes back and she's got a Bible and a crucifix, right? There you <laughs> a go. crucifix and a Bible. Perfectly and, you know, reasonable I'm like, tech. Oh. I'm like, great. Old school, you know. But, you know, actually, those, those, uh, those didn't really help. Um, mm. and um, basically all that happened is I, I just was really scared and I was just trying to talk and just over time the energy faded away right so um, the energy sort of exploded and it faded away now after that happened I was going through um, that was the first time and I was like what is going on but after that I, I had things like that happening for a couple of years and uh, boy, I realized awesome. there's a I didn't know what was happening for a couple of years. And I How was scared. How often did they happen? Once a week minimum, you know. Wow. Um, but uh, often... Same demon, different demons? Different different stuff. Um, Any angels yeah, or was, other entities that weren't clearly demons or all sure. demons? Oh, no, sure. I mean, there was a bunch of different entities. Um, actually, on my YouTube, uh, there's tons of videos talking about all those experiences. I put them behind a membership barrier just because, you know, after a while, it just gets embarrassing revealing all that stuff, you know. But... Um, but uh, yeah, and some of them were really amazingly beautiful experiences. Uh, after a couple of years, my shaman, who I hadn't seen in a couple of years, called me over to his house, and we did one of those Cambo ceremonies. And mm -hmm. he's a my shaman's a, he's a devotee of Satya Sai Baba. Mm -hmm. And during the ceremony, he, he evoked Shiva, and I could feel Shiva in the room. I'm like, dude, what is happening here? And it was after that, it was later that afternoon, I was driving away and I felt a, a field of energy around my body. And the next day I learned to meditate. I didn't know what it was. I tried to meditate, meditate before and I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. And then the next day I thought, you know, maybe I'll try meditating into this. Yada, yada, yada. Three days later, I blew Kundalini out of the top of my head meditating. I was just thinking about energy and all of a sudden, boom, crazy experience going to some sort of astral temple or whatever and that was sort of the beginning so there was some kind of like initiation i guess which happened there what i would call shame. the arising and passing away and other people would call all kinds of things but yeah kundalini yeah. opening and whatever sure well, this is one this is actually Initiations, one of the questions yeah. i wanted to get to uh, with your experience some people would stuff. call it you know tiferet or you know there's, there's all the, all these people <laughs> who map these things all kinds of different ways or, yeah so. well that's why i wanted to talk to you because you've got this you're sort of uniquely positioned to comment from from all the different sides because you've had the experiences you know and um that's really cool some people would call that knowledge and conversation of the holy guardian angel you know it just kind of depends on your yeah criteria for things dude that's amazing this is so great it's so good to talk to you uh, <laughs> um so yeah so so after that then things sort of changed once i got that and that initiation then what i discovered was i discovered that oh i can work with energy and it turned into a really sensual thing. And it, it sort of, what I thought is like, this is, I didn't know anything, but I started reading lots of books and it seemed to me it was Tantra. And I was playing with these sensual ideas. And so one of the things that you talk about sometimes, and it's actually the first thing I wanted to talk about you with is, um, is meditation objects. And so a lot of people seem to like use the breath as meditation. And when I was trying to meditate before these events, I could, I just couldn't do it. I'm like, what? It was so abstract, meditating on the breath. I mean, it's, it's not there. It's moving. I just didn't understand it conceptually. And um, I didn't really get that until later. But um, 
one of the things I noticed you've mentioned on like a couple of your uh, podcasts and other people's channels is that um, is that indeed there are many different meditational objects, and you brought up the Fushuda Maga and some other some other subjects. Now, what I ended up doing is I actually ended up meditating meditating on sensual energy, and that is like unstoppable. And so sometimes when people come to me, not that they come that much, and they're trying to learn how to meditate, and that's actually one of the things I want to talk about you too is that. Uh, a lot of people who do ayahuasca or who have these experiences, um, a lot of them don't think the same states are possible without medicine or drugs or whatever. And yeah, dude, this, I hear that one a lot, actually. Um, although, yeah, that's I mean, I've, you know, done a few psychedelics and um, done intensive meditation and. You know, I've had equally intense experiences. Um, actually, some of the most extreme experiences were actually um, this meditative. So, yeah, right. yeah, and yeah. Um, so it, it is definitely true that there's a range of talent and accessibility that people have, and that obviously can change as you're de describing. So it may be that for these people, it is hard at that time to access things through meditation. That may that may be kind of true. Maybe they yeah. would need a much higher dose or just don't have those pathways built or access or whatever. And it's also true that even some people who go on years of intensive retreats don't have a lot of intensive experiences. So that's also yeah. true. They, they don't really get into very, what I would think of as very interesting territory. It stays about knee pain and psychology, which is, can be very interesting, but it's not the, the deep stuff. And then you have other people. I was just talking to a person who literally they're first sit you know he got into this you know explosion of consciousness rapture bliss thing yeah. and so um so there's this wide range of dose dependency and and some of that may perhaps be true for them but also if they haven't tried or it may be true for them then so it may also be that in some number of years or after so much whatever experiences or development that they do have much easier access so there's yeah. it's a, it's actually a pretty complicated topic one of the things that happened to me is like Previous to those events, I was trying to meditate. I didn't know much. I'm like, well, I'm going to try not to think about things or I'm going to try and meditate in the breath. And it was very difficult. But the big sort of insight that came to me was that, um, and this is what I tell people, is that meditate on something you want to think about, right? So whatever it is, now that, the thing is, is this is, um, you don't tend to hear this from meditation teachers. You know, they tend to, I mean, like your generic meditation teacher will tend to say meditate on the breath. And I think part of that is because it's very safe, right? It's a very safe subject matter. Uh, whereas meditating on desirous objects, I've had some events meditating on sensual ideas, which is really, really powerful, but it also can evoke spirits like demons and stuff very easily, right. very True. easily. For right? some, um, sometimes. Yeah. Um, and I want to talk to you about that stuff too, because I mean, you've, you've been doing the magical stuff too. I mean, it's really interesting. Um, so for you, like if you're teaching someone to meditate, do you usually just start like with breath and try and, I mean, it is an abstract topic or do you just go with something else? You know, I actually have very long conversations with people before I start suggesting most meditation tech. And so yeah. the, the thing I've learned is that you have to get a sense of like who they are, what they want to do, what their risk profile is, what kind of things they've already tried and kind of what happened when they tried those things. Um, yeah, things about their goals, like what is, what is it they value and what are their life circumstances? How much time do they have? How, how much could they tolerate disruption? Because it is true that different objects probably do have sort of different safety profiles from a kind of a mental health stability function point yeah. of view, you know? And you know, obviously each of these has a distributed range around them, some that might some people might think of as very safe, might be unsafe in certain hands and very unsafe, be safe for some people. So who knows? You don't know until you try. But, but I actually tend to have a pretty long conversation with people. And so the breath as object these days, I actually don't tend to recommend that much necessarily. I actually find people find it a boring object, kind of a frustrating object. And a lot of the people who contact me are actually more interested in deep dive stuff anyway. That's why yeah. they're talking to somebody like me or more interested in magic or more interested in whatever they're interested in. And yeah. so uh, these days I, I end up recommending, well, it depends on the person. If they're all like dark nighty, I tend to recommend sort of Dzogcheni Mahamudra-y kind of stuff, as well as loving kindness practices, which is turning into pleasant feelings. 
just yeah. subtly different than desirous pleasant feelings a very fine mm -hmm. line there sometimes between love and desire right so right on that yeah. edge and it, i can easily drift over um and but fire casino is the one i end up talking about with a lot of people these days but just because it simultaneously moves people on the fronts of insight concentration archetypal stuff psychology and just weird magical things and yeah. so because it kind of does all of those and so i end up talking about casino practice which is like for those who don't know what that term is it's using an external object as a support for internal generation of stuff so you might look at a candle flame for a minute close your eyes follow whatever after images and stuff you see until you feel like opening your eyes again look at the flame close your eyes do it again but if you do that in higher and higher doses like eight to you know 10 12 15 hours a day you can pretty rapidly get into some pretty wild territory i have a whole site about this you know my firecasino.org this casino with a k k a s i n a um site and there's a lot of people talking about their experiences and advice there it's sort of a crowdsourced um collective of trying to help people deal with this territory in something like a skillful way because it can get pretty weird right so this is not entirely safe stuff if you as you yeah. started to notice for yourself and so that's one of the topics i talk about but you know it really varies by the practitioner and sometimes if energy is what's going on we'll just talk about energy or blockages or trauma or whatever it is so when people come to me with different things i, I tend to to try to build something kind of i'll look at the range of stuff i know something about from my experiences and the range i've heard other people talk about and what i've read and then i'll usually build something semi-custom for that that relates to often some kind of mix of emphases that just I think for whatever reason would be useful for them. And then they get to go try it out and see if that's true. Yeah. What you're saying about trauma and blockages in, is interesting, which leads me into the next thing I was going to talk about is um, what I discovered after those like experiences, I became aware of the works of Franz Bardon, who I think yeah. you're aware of. Yeah. And I, I became a bit of a devotee of Franz Bardon and the whole elemental balance techniques. And um and uh, yeah, so that was really interesting. And one of the things, the other thing I discovered, which briefly, uh, there's a book by um, Robert Bruce, who's a kind of a magician guy, who's got a book called Energy Work, uh, in which he describes um, an event he calls chakra strobing. And what I decided is those experiences I'd been having were chakra strobing. And what it is, is the energy builds up and builds up. But because you're not energetically balanced, it sort of builds up and then discharges all of a sudden which creates these events of like, oh, I'm breaking into another dimension and where am I and this kind of stuff. And so the whole process of uh, energy balancing became really interesting to me. Of course, I didn't really know what it was because it's like, and when we're talking about energy, it's like earth, water, fire, and air, which seems silly at first. You're like, that doesn't mean <laughs> anything. Those are just like words or like those don't exist. Um and um, I started trying to think about what those meant. And you see, I think those things you sort of have to discover it for yourself. And as I was going through this process, that was that was when I started having these crazy experiences in consciousness. And that was when I discovered your book because um, I was, what I, what I realized is I was going through this process of refinement. So I'd be thinking about something and I'd be in one state of consciousness in the earth. And then I would sort of transform into the water and they would transform into air for if so we you know i'm doing stuff i'm like what is going on i'm like and I'm, like nobody understood what I was, i've got my youtube channel and stuff i don't have a wide circle of friends who talk about this stuff you know and i'm in chile like a you know and it's um so i'm not i'm not around a big group of uh similar people really at the moment anyway so i was trying to figure out and that was when i found your book and it was talking about the janas i'm like dude this is the same thing i'm like the elements I'm like, there's something going on. Of course, they're different. There seems to be some difference. And I'm wondering, like, um, I think you're aware of Bardon and the elements and stuff. And um, would you, does it seem possible that those things are sort of analogous in some way to you? So just so you know, in terms of uh, Bardon stuff, so I found his books, I don't know, 10, 12 years ago and read through the four books I was able to download online because I think they're free PDFs now or something. Yeah. I was able to find them. And um and read through them and, and thought about a bunch about them. And it's a lot of relatively standard kind of West, Western magical tech. I mean, it's pretty much in, in the general range, the general neighborhood of, of a lot of the standard Western esoteric sure. stuff. And um, yeah, I could appreciate it. And then, but 
in my own practice, just doing the casinos. So the casinos come out of these, some of these books. I mean, they're, they're actually probably pre-Buddhist. So the, the, looks like the Buddha showed up and they were already there and it would be using the earth element, the air element, the fire element, the water element, the space element, the consciousness element, or a color such yeah. as white or yellow or blue or red or something like that as a support for concentration. So if you've got 10 casinos traditionally. And so I, I started playing around and I was actually semi-inspired by Donald uh, Michael Craig's Modern Magic, where he was talking about he's got these elemental practices of tuning into the solidity, the fluidity, the airiness, the temperature aspects, yeah. et cetera. So you can find those. And so I was I was using a mix of Buddhist tech and kind of Donald Michael Craigian stuff, and then just high dose doing this on retreat, where my yeah. concentration was just so much stronger. It just makes it way easier to get into the like the the meat of the, the essence of what this is really about. And yeah. then um, and so have had a lot of powerful elemental experiences and even gone to seemingly full elemental realms and suddenly found myself in the ocean or underwater or, you know, <laughs> having these experiences of rocks or wind or snow or rain or, uh, you know, all these things, fire and heat and, and, and all these, uh, like, I remember one time I was on a fire casino retreat and I came into the main meditation hall, which was a yurt and it was Canada in November. So it was pretty cold that night and someone had let the fire go out and I was the only one in there. It was pretty cold. I don't know how cold it was, but it was pretty chilly in there. And so I, I got the fire going, but it, it really hadn't heated the place up yet. And I was still pretty cold. Um, so I sat down and I just decided to try to evoke some fire element. Yeah. And I just was like, okay, fire <laughs> element, come on. And but within about like, you know, a very few number of seconds, I was suddenly like sweating and like having to <laughs> take my jacket off. And it was like, wow, so it was sort of overkill. I kind of overshot. I didn't recognize how powered <laughs> up I was and how easy the, it would be to find the the volume knob on temperature. Amazing. But, I, you know, I, had, I was probably 15 or 17 or 18 days, something like that into my fire casino retreat. And I just wow. hadn't really, tip, you know, put it through its paces. And all of a sudden I was roasty toasty and and good to go but it was it's you know so i've had a bunch of these kinds of experiences and yeah. um yeah and the thing is if if somebody's listening to this the thing i would say is just just practice in high dose not that that's not risky it can be but yeah. you start practicing like you know 10 12 14 hours a day and doing some sort of you know practice where you're getting your concentration strong on your chosen object or element or whatever you're very likely to get into some cool territory and what yeah. i found is that all the casinos and elements eventually kind of lead to the others. They start showing up in surprising ways. Like I was on this that same retreat, actually, it was a month long of doing this all day long for a month. Um, and all of a sudden, all this water started showing up, even though I'm using fire as my object. And all this earth stuff started showing up and all this air mm -hmm. stuff started showing up. So you start getting these other elements that can start showing up, even if you're using one of them. They all kind of lead to... You know, that it just starts opening up the territory to elemental stuff in general. Yeah. Now, the um, there's this sort of sort of cool magical aspect of the elements. The thing that seems uh, for me at the time, which was valuable, is the balancing the elements. Franz Bardon says that if you have balanced elements, you don't go crazy. Right. So that was what attracted me to it. So balancing the elements. And I was like, OK, let's try doing this. And it, I honestly it did help. Uh, but it does lead one to wonder, like, um, how did they get so unbalanced in the first place? And as I mentioned, you know, I was doing these sort of central meditations and uh, un unbelievable. So one of the things I was doing is like, um, because I was meditating in, in the elements and I was doing quite a lot of reading, I was thinking about the chakras, which also represent elements, right? And what I was, if you read some of like the, the some of the, I don't know if they're mainstream tantra texts, but the, some of them, and certainly some of the magical stuff and Crowley stuff, talks about the chakra as being symbolic of the vagina, for example, right? And so, so one of the things I was, and I was doing this completely intuitively. So what I would do is I would think about the, the petals of the chakra and I would use my awareness and just gen <laughs> gently stroke, <laughs> just gently, gently stroke the, the, uh, the leaf, the petal of the chakra and, and just do it in a sort of sensual way. And that became, dude, it's just crazy. And actually what would happen is it would be abstract out. So you might start off with like a sort of sensual idea, let's say, but you would abstract it out into just like the form, like the curve. So it would just be a curve of energy. So you now you've abstracted it into something else. And then, and then for example, what I might do is I think about um, like, uh, I didn't do this at first, but eventually I did to avoid negative experiences. 
I would start visualizing this as like an aspect of God, for example, right? So mm -hmm. I'd say, okay, this is actually an aspect of God. And wow, that that really took off. But um, but uh, yeah, so I think there's there's some way of doing this. Anyway, one of the things is before I learned about focusing on the aspects of God, I was having some of these really not much actually, but sometimes demonic or vampiric evocations. Because whenever you go into like sensuality, if you're not really, really on guard with your with your intentions, then it's dangerous. And that actually brings me to something I want to talk to you too. Because one of the things I was reading through your book again just before Christmas uh, when we were thinking of chatting, and um, and the one thing is funny, all the magical stuff, oh, it's, it's sexy, you know, it's like magic, evocation, and everything. <laughs> the one thing is funny. I've, I've matured. I've matured. Reading through your book now, what caught my what caught, caught my attention this time was the whole beginning of the book is about morality, right? It's about morality. And I'm like, oh man, I must have skipped this the first time I read this book, <laughs> right? Yeah. And I keep right? bringing it up. Like I, I use the word again and again, page after page. People totally miss it sometimes. It's, it's anyway. not sexy, Daniel, but it's so important, <laughs> right? <laughs> well, um, it can be. I mean, that's the funny thing. So the notion that morality wouldn't be sexy, I wonder about that, actually. So are, are people sure that some sort of loving, kind, thoughtful, mutual relationship couldn't be very attractive? Are you sure? Maybe that yeah. is very attractive, actually. Maybe the notion of, of real care and people enjoying themselves in some healthy, you know, mutually satisfying way is, you know, consenting adults, you know, how is that not how could that yeah. not be very valuable? I mean, it brings up the great debate of like, you know, sort of forbidden sex versus true love. You know, this is yeah. one of the great human challenges. And, you know, and so uh, obviously true love is one of the, the big competitors for something that might be considered extremely valuable. And so hopefully yeah. in the notion of true love is the notion of real care, real concern, mutual, symbiotic, beneficial, benevolent. You know that's yeah. morality and so so and then what do you do with the other side right so that's the sort of shadow side the forbidden part the the and that's where um yeah a a lot of tantra teachings come in can be very useful a lot of shadow work can come in a lot of jungian stuff a lot of internal family systems work can be very interesting yeah. a lot of just being honest with oneself because that side of us is there also and so yeah. that full range of humanity, acknowledging that it can be very challenging for some people who are very idealistic about how humans might be or how they might be in particular, but it's obviously extremely useful. And there's no question, as you mentioned, that tuning into um, more erotic imagery or um, sounds or whatever, some, you know, all, there are a lot of different things that might be erotic. And so tuning into that obviously can be very galvanizing for attention, which is why one finds, for example, in Tibetan Buddhism, so many uh, tantric images that are explicitly sexual. Yeah. And so they acknowledge that and attempt to turn, sort of transmute that or direct that play to that, but then redirect it to the notion of something divine, benevolent, um, some skillful understanding the you know the wisdom of emptiness and compassion you know yeah. unified something and, and so you you start uh, you know so a lot of them will work with that and then try to tune it to something skillful very much following the progression that you just described for yourself yeah. of initially starting with the the more edgy stuff and then tuning it to this notion of God or the divine. Yeah. Um, and something. And, and so that's mirroring that same sort of developmental progression that a lot of the tantric traditions attempt. Yeah, my insight at the end of the day was that it wasn't that you could get as sexual as you wanted. And actually, but the sexuality was God. The problem was, is like there was like negative imagery coming in. And that wasn't part mm. of it. That was like, so you'd get like, like, so you're, you're focusing on some sensual thing, but then like, maybe you've got some kink. And it comes in and you're like, wait a minute, that's not part of this. Because there's this, the actual flow of energy, the actual, it's like the flow of life, let's call it, which is like this flow of infinite divine energy, which feels sexual. And that's what, that's actually what you're trying to approach, even in sex, if it's, if it's a healthy sexual attitude. But what happens is there's this like obverse, I guess it's like what, like the, the, the other side of that is that, um, 
is that uh, maybe you've got some issues. And so what happens is- As everybody got, does, basically. Yeah. Everybody has some kind of issue somewhere. So somebody told me, like, after, after one vampiric evocation, I was talking to my friend Hilmar, and he was like, dude, he's like, you need to stop doing all the central stuff. He's like, what you need to do is, is start, uh, start sort of being more prayerful about it. And I was, I was like, dude, a prayer? What are you talking about? I was like, no, no, I've got, I've got this covered, man. But he <laughs> convinced me, he convinced me to get a try, you know, and it was actually really powerful. And um, it convinced nice. me that what was interesting about it is that, um, like you were saying, I, I, the reason I'm mentioning this because you were mentioning about having sort of skillful means. And I think one of the things that happens is there's this like real negative view in many meditational uh, traditions, maybe about sexuality, where actually it's not the sexuality is the problem. It's the interpretation of it, which see, at least in my case, seemed to come from what, if, what, uh, what somebody was telling me. It's these, it's the archetypes of the I'm not an expert in the nomenclature here, but the divine masculine and the divine feminine and those sure. like somehow when you're which like is the essence child, of Gnosticism, which is the essence of most tantric techniques, which is, yeah, right. Right. And just seems somehow hardwired into humanity to deal yeah. with that. So there's something with that. So I started trying to like, like, do like, look, I'm going to try heal. And it sounds silly, you know, it doesn't sound silly. Not at the time. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Try heal the inner child or whatever, you know, but that stuff does seem to help, you know, like as far as like balancing it out. Um, and so I guess like, um, yeah, it's interesting because there's so many people like, uh, like and especially in Tantra, because people say, well, Tantra is not about sex. It's not about sex. And of course, there's a lot of different aspects about, about Tantra, right? Which is, um, mm -hmm. which is, uh, so I've done a little bit of reading. There's this whole thing of the, what's that Christopher Wells with the recognition sutras, where you actually are focusing on your body and recognizing the senses and that's Tantra. And that's it's sort of focusing on the body, but the actual focus on the sexual aspect and recognizing it as God seemed really valuable to me. And it was, um, yeah, that was pretty intense. Um, but in your experience, uh, did you have to do any of this, this sort of balancing of the elements? Was that something that you, I mean, you seem like a pretty well-balanced guy here. I mean, you're, you're, you're sort of an overachiever. You're sort of, uh, right? So you're kind of yeah. balanced. So maybe you didn't have any of these big interruptions. You've had some big, uh, you, you've run into sort of demonic characters yourself in your journeys? Yeah, or no? yeah? sure. Um, not that many, really. I mean, you know, it kind of depends on where you want to draw the line. <laughs> Um, yeah. So that's, uh, and, um, ha, you know, but what, one of the interesting things I've noticed is even demonic energies, just like, you know, just like rapture and bliss have this sort of uh, sensuous, seductive, whatever side to them, right? So yeah. everything has its, its light and dark aspects. In, in the same way, um, even the most demonic things I've run into usually had, the, nothing seems to be purely evil. Like, I don't think I've run into anything that I thought it was like, could was a hundred percent pure evil though some things yeah. seem pretty darn creepy and malevolent they all have their points their logic their point of view their their something and um, there's usually something to be learned from any of these which is interesting yeah. they're usually revelatory of something even conveying some sort of unpleasant truth and so are you having like conversations in the, or like sort of mental conversations in these contexts yeah. So how have I experienced entities a wide range of ways from everything like you experienced the sense of a presence to the sense of like, oh, wait, this energy moving through the situation or even maybe driving it that I even can't sense, but I can see the effects of it. Yep. Like I can I could see some pattern or something sometimes. And so my, you know, I, my imagination to be very, very creative and my sense of intuition can be very l loose associating and, and free and open to a lot of possibilities. And so um, uh, and so letting it do what it does, it can, it can come up with all kinds of interesting ways of seeing patterns and energies in situations, in people, in texts, in movies, in video, in nature, in weather, and in all kinds of stuff. It can be very interesting to open up to that sort of intuitive, free associative um, side. And then, um, but some have been actually like seeing them, like full on seeing them, seeing them in the room, seeing them with eyes closed. Um, a wide range of entities across the great range. Um, some have seemed to just be like, oh, that's an entity. And I didn't really interact with it. Yeah, I was like, there it is over there. I'm going to go over this way. We didn't really have an interaction. And then yeah, some yeah. were like direct interaction. And 
and then some that that took on a much more complicated thing where there might have been a long back and forth of trying to figure out what this thing was or what it meant or how to deal with it it was you know lessons that took some longer period of time to learn and from that sort of all this is a possible source of education framework yeah. and point of view um but in terms of getting back to your question in terms of elemental balance so i'll give a very interesting example of like what that might mean to somebody um yeah. so we were on this fire casino retreat uh, a few three of us and we were in this rented defensive tower, medieval defensive tower in Scotland called the Tower of Halbar. Oh, yeah. And uh, we were doing this intensive, you know, fire casino visualization practice. And about, I don't know, it was like probably eight or nine days in, I noticed that, whereas when I first got the, there, you know, this is Scotland in February in a big stone cold <laughs> tower with a few electric heaters, most of it was pretty darn cold, yeah. right? It was not insulated, it's just big old cold, wet stone walls. And so, I had noticed that, you know, about a week or so in, I suddenly was walking around barefoot in sweatpants and a t-shirt, whereas before I was like bundled up in three layers and wool socks and hat. Wow. And I was like getting, I started getting hotter and hotter. And then yep. somewhere around day eight or nine or so, I was noticing that um, two of the other people were actually going down. There was this little creek that sort of flowed below the tower. And I noticed them going down to the creek and literally like putting their hands in the creek and holding cold stones. Wow. And this water is probably like 33 degrees or like one degree yeah. probably to the rest of the world who isn't, you know, um, Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit. And yeah. so, um, <laughs> and so it's really, really like bone chillingly cold. And after a, another day or so, I got why they were doing that. I was like, I'm too hot. And I would go down there and I would literally just put my hands in the creek and hold the, the cold stones under the water and get those additional elements in. And I started really tuning them into them. It's like, you know, water element, earth yeah. element. And, and all of a sudden, and it would ground me and it would make me feel better. I started taking longer baths. I started spending more time going up on the roof. They had this amazing view from like the parapets of this tower and could look out the battlements over the like space and sky to get that yeah. air space element and started like really appreciating trees and stones. And again, earth, it's like, and, and I started recognizing, wait a second, if I don't do this, I'm just like getting hotter and hotter and edgier and edgier and fireier and fireier. This is not right. And so if you're finding that in your own practice, you can actually do things that seem like ridiculously simple or like absurd that they would work until yeah. you do them. And you're like, no, actually holding a cold stone under cold water does help you ground down if you're too fiery, for example. Yeah, I watched, a, I watched a video of that guy, Sadguru, and he was talking about this tantric practice called Buddha Shudi. And there's a bunch of ways of doing it, but the way he discussed that, he's obviously doing like an introduction video for YouTube, but he's, what he's talking about is like, if you want to experience the fire element, stand in front of a fire. And it sounds silly. And it's like, if you want to feel the wind, touch the wind. But it actually, it has an impression of the effect. Uh, when I started doing it, I was sort of more in the sort of level of consciousness, trying to think about consciousness. And I was thinking, gee, that sounds stupid. But actually, that actually, you have to go down to the physical level also to experience it there, right? So all the different levels work. So I guess that's what you were doing there, too. It's so cool. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, uh, so if you're having these experiences, I saw one of your podcasts where you'd mentioned you came home from work and there was an entity and you're like, oh, I'm too tired. You yeah, that was your... actually in this room right above me, actually, the really? attic room of the, the studio <laughs> I'm sitting in. I walked up the stairs and there was this Garuda thing sitting on my bed and it was like 70% opaque. You know, maybe you could yeah. see through it a little bit and had this sort of Amazing. fancy outfit on kind of bird beakish things. Wow. Anyway, it was just sitting there on the bed smiling at me and I was just too tired and I was like, I just don't have the time to deal with this right now. And I literally just, it's probably the rudest thing you could do to an, you know, you know, astral entity or whatever this thing is, whatever yeah. planet it's on. And I literally just lay down right into its space and curled up and went to sleep. And as I was like laying down, I could kind of see it sort of around me for a few seconds until it disappeared and went away. You know, I got, yeah. but I was just like, I'm just too tired. It'd been too long a day in the ER. I just didn't have time to deal with it. There was probably some interactive opportunity. It was there to tell me right. something and I missed it or I don't know, but I just, <laughs> I just didn't have it in me. I was just too fried. I was like, I'm sorry, man. I don't know. I just don't need to be dealing with the Garita, Garita in my bed now. I just need to sleep. When you think of those different sort of like you're saying, it's like an astral creature. And that was kind of where I started doing like the element stuff, thinking about consciousness. I would be thinking about, I thought about water is like the imagination and like the astral zone. 
And then I think about the mental, like somebody was saying, for example, uh, if you think about morality, that's part of the mental body because you can't visualize, you cannot visualize morality really. So it's like a mental structure, right? So I'd be going through these different sort of layers, like, okay, a visual is the astral and then a mental structure. And I'd, I'd, I'd allow my, my consciousness to move these different sort of uh, awarenesses of what these different things mean. Um, and I, it's, I'm trying to get back over here to the jhanas because one of the things that happens in the jhanas, which I learned from your book, was that uh, it seems that what happens um, there's a process. I learned this from your book. The process is you get a meditation object and then you focus on the object until you achieve access concentration. Boom. More or less. And once you get access concentration, then you're, um, I'm paraphrasing here, then you uh, uh, eventually, you're going to, if you're lucky, achieve the first jhana, which is a feeling of joy? Or is a feeling of, what is it? So, so for first John, a typical description is you're going to have PT and Sukha. So you're going to have rapture and bliss, depending on how you want to translate these words into English, which is like, or happiness and joy or, but actually, um, so PT is actually defined all these different ways. There might be trembling, there might be bliss, there might be vibrations. It's got all these more formal aspects to it. It's a kind of a complex topic. And then, but, you know, and then with a, a basically born of what's called Vitaka and Vichara, which is are complicated terms to translate into English, but basically is like you're applying your mind to the object and holding it on the object. So it's like you aim the mind at the breath and you hold it on the breath. You aim the mind at bliss and you hold it on bliss. And it's like this aiming and rubbing or we sort of like where you'd like imagine if you were like um, trying to clean a window, you take the 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 cloth and you put it on the window and then you start rubbing to clean the window, something like that. And it's, and it's the ability to, with effort, to hold the mind on the object. And so the second genre, the big interesting thing about that is with the dropping of applied and sustained, you know, effort or attention, or however you want to translate it, we talk and we chara, then you get this increase in um, rapture and happiness born of stronger concentration, which is now the, because some portion of your bandwidth is going to be taken up with the effort and when your mind is able to do it much more effortlessly, then the other more pleasurable factors can come through. And looking at, by the way, looking at the sort of tuning into sensuality that you were talking about, from yeah. a Buddhist point of view, tuning into those kinds of pleasant feelings is all in that sort of rapture category, which is they have something called the seven factors of awakening, and it's the middle one. So you start with mindfulness being able to pay attention to what is and then investigation which typically would be noticing exactly how things are and how they're interacting what's actually really going on at a more intricate level and then energy which is where the bright mindedness starts to kick in and then rapture is that middle one and okay. this is tuning into pleasant enjoyable interesting sensuous qualities and then then you have tranquility concentration and equanimity and really you want all of these balanced but different people will have different ones they kind of come into this through or they're initially stronger in. So yeah. you may be a, a desirous type, for example, which is why that might have been your in. And so yeah. um, so I'm an aversive type, which is fine. And this is this typing system that like is not very like you get a trophy for showing up. It's really the reverse yeah. of that. It's like you're either desirous, <laughs> you know, um, aversive or ignorant. And so it's not being nice to anybody. But <laughs> But a lot of desirous people one of their ways in is through jhana and is through their ability of the mind cares about pleasurable sensations or pleasurable yeah. images. And so that, if you can use that skillfully, is a way to get into the territory of real concentration stuff. Yeah. Whereas I was more of an aversive type, it was way easier for me to tear reality to sputtering, irritating fragments. Um, and so and that and was why, my entrance in. But each, everybody's you different. The, uh, You've got your different proclivities, your different tendencies. I think you were saying in your book or or somewhere that your the the technique which gave you the most bang your buck was just noting. Yeah, right? which was which noting. was a, it's a, it's a deconstructive technique. It's yeah. almost it's very right. hard to get jhanic or stable states in it because you're you're constantly just bop, 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 this that 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 you know whatever. Breath, yeah. breath, breath, rising, falling, falling, thinking, hearing, seeing. And so it's a very deconstructive technique, whereas tuning into a sensualist image is a very sort of a constructive technique. And, yeah. um, Interesting. and okay, yeah. but again, we each have our, our initial kind of software or hardware or personality traits or whatever that we're given. And then yeah. 
it is definitely true that the things we're most drawn to are the things that if there's a meditative version of them are the most likely, I think on average, based on my experiences and those of the people I've talked with, to get people into cool territory. It's really interesting. One of the things you were saying there about, um, about uh, it's almost like rapture. That feel like, that's yeah. like rapture is almost like the interface. Like it is. <clears throat> it's like the interface. It's like, oh, that sort of feels good. And you sort of, and you allow yourself to sort of immerse yourself, right? Or and push into it. And that is weird. There's like these sort of zones. There's like interfaces, right? Which, mm -hmm. and what we think, like as a common human being, you don't think of them as interfaces. You just think, oh, Oh, that feels good. You don't realize what you're actually playing with, right? It's actually an interface right. into something else. It's like the imagination is an interface, right? Sure. And your mom yeah. tells you, stop, stop thinking about that. It's just your imagination. And no, it's actually the interface in the pure consciousness, mom. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Um, there was a, yeah, there, was there are a, a lot of these types of doorways. Oh, I just want to finish finish yeah. out one more thing. Sorry. So yeah. ig ignorant types are probably like, hey, what do we do for ignorant types? And yeah. ignorant types yeah. are kind of like spacey, kind of diffuse, kind of like what, you know, huh? What was that? I don't know. So they're not. Um, but they actually initially often do best focusing on tranquility and equanimity. Yeah, where they're yeah. not really trying to tune into the specifics, but they're resting in that sort of quality of mind. Really cool book, by the way, um, Journey Without Goal. Um, I think it's okay. chapter nine, The Five Buddha Families by Chogyam Trungpa okay. is a fascinating discussion of a, a slightly more sophisticated um, personality typing system than the, the one I was talking about just in the Theravada with the ignorant sorry, you know, aversive or desirous types, whereas yeah. this one is breaking it down into five families and so just is a little more nuanced, but they're both basically getting at the same thing, that we each have all okay. these aspects or possible modes within us, but yeah. that, and that each of those is something workable, that we can take what we've been given as kind of our personality structure or our wiring or our tendencies and our sense doors that we're the best at, the, the way we relate to thoughts, you know, the most easily, and there's almost always a meditative version of that that can then take that strength and play yeah. that as the first cards we play down, like play your strong cards first to stay. So when in you're interviewing people before you teach them, that's kind of what you're looking for. Yeah. Because when I was like, I was like, people would come to me asking me stuff, and I'd be like, Dude, just focus on central ideas. But obviously, some people don't. They're like, what? What? I the sucked at that. <laughs> Right. <laughs> or whatever I, or even if i had found it interesting i was i had tried jonic stuff where i tried to yeah. concentrate on whatever i was terrible at it but i could okay, easily yeah. tear reality to shreds tearing yeah. reality to shreds easy i i later yeah. learned the genre so i later learned how to tune into very stable concentration and bliss and peace and tranquility equanimity formal stuff and all that but it was yeah. not my forte that was so i um i came yeah. into that through a, a different kind of pathway but there's lots of ways to go and so you just kind of need to work with what you got and then identify your strengths, play to those. And then you start building in, hopefully flushing out the things you don't do as well. Event, you know, once you've got some, some finger holds on real territory and yeah. Yeah. You know, I was going to ask you, I was going to move into the Janus here because I, I want to talk about that, but I'm, I'm worried I forget to talk about this. One of the things which surprises me really is that, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, a lot of Buddhists, and like in your book too, I, it just generally, people don't, like they're rising and passing away. It's kind of like, uh, like, and a lot of teachers are just like, well, you know, it's energetic and, you know, and it doesn't seem to be, it's almost like people don't take it seriously. And it's like, I'm like, what? <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll tell you. It's like I'll tell not you my taking experience. the onset of puberty seriously. Right. Like people are different. You're yeah. suddenly very I, different. Well, my experience, my experience with that is, it's like so mind blowing, but I will tell you what I did is this year. Have you heard of that thing, Rasa? It's an energy transmission. It's this guy Ramaji. He's an American guru guy. No, and it's I don't know. The tell me. It's called the Ramaji Advaita Shaktipat Attunement. And so mm. I've been working with one of his students, uh, and it's like a it's an energy transmission. And oh, cool. uh, I did it about nine months ago, and I I awoke like two days later, and it was funny because you know I've had all these mega Kundalini experiences, and I was like, dude. Uh, because you know, I'm enlightened or whatever, you know, you think there's <laughs> nothing, nothing prepared me for that. Right. No, it was what like, was it really, like, if you don't mind describing it, it'd be interesting to hear it. It was really, it was, it was, it was, really, it was really beautiful. And what happened was, um, 
this guy Christer, he's in Denmark. Uh, we did it, and it was we had a chat, and we did that. Short what did you 15, do? Oh, short fifty minute meditation, and that was it online. And I was he's a nice guy, and we got off, and I'm like, yeah, whatever. That was bullshit, you know. And I'm like, I've got all my experiences, right? Like, dude, like I'm like nobody knows what's out there, you know. <laughs> but whatever. So anyway, the next day I had to go in town to do like to do some stuff at like the insurance company or whatever, and I'm. I'm driving back home and I'm coming over this hill and there's this beautiful bay here in Chile where I live. And it's just this gorgeous view. And so I'm driving over the hill and I just look up and there's a cloud. And dude, I, I, I just look up at the cloud and it's, uh, it knows me. It, and mm. it's like, uh, and then all of a sudden it just expands out into the whole universe. And I stopped the car and I just sat there in this little, like in complete knowledge of everything or something. Hmm. And I'm like, and I didn't know what it was. And it was, uh, it wasn't the way I think about it is the way I think about it now is it seems to me that Kundalini is Shakti and awakening. At least uh, this is not exactly true, but like what I perceive as awakening is Shiva. So all those NP events, which are like incredibly energetic and everything. And then this thing was just like, it was like, it was just like nothingness or love or something. And I'm not even, I'm not claiming to be fully awakened here. I'm just saying this is, it was, uh, it was something, something happened, which I'd never had before. And ever since then, my meditations have changed now. So when I meditate, it's, it's just different. It's just a different meditation. In what so ways? Now, what are the specific differences you notice? Oh, this is, you're the guy. To, you're the guy. You're the guy this who is, can rip this apart, man. This yeah, is, that's what. So. I, that's what I'm interested in. Sure. Yeah. So what? Do you, so describe the specific changes. Okay. Well, I mean, in the past, I would do this meditation on. I haven't done this in a while, but that meditation on the petals is pretty representative, right? Where is, uh, and this is something that happens is when you move into these, when you get new knowledge, like this Rasa, whatever, it tend, at least for me, it tends to be I find stuff which uh, supports it at the same time. So around that time, I found that book, the Recognition Sutras by Christopher Wallace, which discusses how to meditate on the senses, right? And so you meditate on individual senses as a tantric practice, and, uh, and you recognize that it's not Scott, right? It's not me, right? These are, these are the instruments of something else, right? These are instruments of the mind or pure consciousness or whatever it is, who knows, right? But it's not me, right? It's not, it's not, it's not who I am, right? So this is, that's pretty much my meditation now. It's like, I just, I go in and it's just like, everything changes. And of course I've had big events happening in this too. Like um, one thing I happened about six months ago is I was, this was, this was the day after, I've done a few of the Rasa things since then. Cause it's, I just keep going back to keep doing it, you know, but um so I was doing it one day, I went to bed and I, I literally just lay down in bed and I thought, okay, I'll just try meditating. I closed my eyes and instantly white light just <sighs> descends upon me. And mm. I'm in like a different, it's like a DMT world or something. I'm like, I have no idea where I am. Shiva's there. And it's all of a sudden I see how, I see this way of um, all like all the problems. Like I got an addictive personality. I love beer. I love coffee, you know? All this stuff, and it just and it just it just it just eliminates those. I mean, it hasn't mm. actually elim eliminated them, but it showed me what my life would be without all that stuff. And like, it's just this purity, and um, and uh, and it told me I should start transmitting energy myself to people, which I'm not comfortable doing that. But I mean, it, it was telling me to do that. So I'm get not, informed I'm not consent. This... That's my biggest thing. Like, yeah, you're gonna transmit energy, get informed consent, have a conversation about what you're gonna do. Right. recognize that if you're giving energy that way, you're going to get energy back and yep. realize that all energetic systems are complicated and interactive. So yeah. just, you know, so I, I think that, you know, just have a conversation about, Hey, here's the energy I would like to give out, you know, just recognize other stuff is going to come through. Cause that's the nature of energy. Right. <laughs> and, I did uh, a few times, so, like I, I, on my YouTube channel, I, I told a few people and like, I got like eight people come. So I did like two or three times, I think, but I'm mm -hmm. just like, it, it's not my bag, I guess, you know. Like, okay, well, like, totally get that. Yeah, don't right. do it if it doesn't feel right. Yeah, I, it was interesting. It was interesting. It just feels a little, yeah, I don't know. Maybe it will, sometime I'll do it, you know. But uh, generally, that was a sort of interesting experience. But generally, experience is this experience of um, of no self, I guess. A good example is yesterday. Meaning? Well, for here's a, here's a good one. Yesterday, I was done at the mall, and I saw this nice, like, baseball cap. And I'm like, oh, that's really cool. So I put it on. 
So I'm driving back and I'm thinking, oh, wow, I look really cool, man. This is really cool, right? And then all of a sudden I'm thinking, wow, I look really cool. And, and it's like, oh, it's not you. And it's like the, this, this modality, which I think is me feeling cool, is actually a part of consciousness. It's not Scott. This is actually, this is something I identify as Scott, which actually it's not who I am, right? And so what's happening is I'm having these events like on a daily basis where you're like, oh, 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 that's not me. Right. And so it's like, it's almost like a deconstruction, which is happening, right? It's a deconstructive yeah. thing. Whereas, like with the Kundalini stuff, it's like this uh, breaking into these dimensions and like magical stuff. Whereas this is just like, I mean, this, I guess, is what they say is like enlightenment de- de- is a destructive process. That's how it feels, right? It feels, and there are sometimes like, I was one day I was at the gas station and then, oh, it was scary. I was putting gas in. Oh, it just like the whole of reality vanished. And I just felt like I was on a rock by myself and like there was nobody here and I'm like what is going mm-hmm. on and it was really scary and then, it, shoop, then everything came back and I was like okay that's that's fine so I mean who knows I mean maybe these you you you're probably going to identify these as NP events I'm guessing well actually that's really complicated and so um, um each of those would actually require more phenomenology so the things okay. when I'm actually formally a Internet diagnosis of people you barely know is notoriously unreliable, even if you're having a conversation. That's the first yeah. important qualifier, even yeah. if someone d- does this a lot, right? The second thing is to really take any of those apart, what I would actually really like to have seen is the the lead up and stuff leading up to them. And so okay. you've got really, for, for to try to diagnose anything, you really need five bits of information. And the first one is the big setup, like, hey, I was having this, I was doing this, I was in this state and this state and this state, and then all of a sudden this happened. So you want to know the stuff that led up to it, because this stuff does tend to unfold in predictable sequences, not always, but often. So then you want to really know something very precise about the entrance, like how the thing came on, which usually is a description of something in less than a second, which might have a lot of detail for that less than a second. Then the thing itself and then the exit from whatever that thing is, and then the after effects and what capabilities, perceptions, whatever changed. And then really you would want also like, then as time moves forward and you get out from that event, what's different, what held up, what doesn't held up, what was just temporary, what is a fundamental structural change and how practices or experiences or one sense of oneself in the world or their interrelationship, et cetera. And so, Each of those things you just described could be a much longer conversation. But in the end, the model I actually like the most is if this stuff is not throwing people. So so all the fine-grained state and stage stuff can be useful for a number of things. It can be useful if someone's getting kind of messed up by something, they're falling into the common traps of it, either over-identification and fascination or disgust and anger or some negative feeling or whatever, or, you know, creeped out by or you know, freaked out by or whatever. So then, you know, if if they're getting thrown off their game, then sometimes being able to apply very states or stage specific tech to that well-known problem, because we we all run into the same problems, basically everybody else did, if we do this long enough, or, you know, most of them. And then, but then the other thing is, is um, recognizing that from another point of view, like if you're okay, then not having the expectations and the labels and the identification, which can just sort of artificially kind of fix, freeze, solidify things, can actually keep people more open to the natural, rich, intricate unfolding, which may have some map-like patterns to it, but really the map, not the territory things we always say. And so um, figuring out how to balance those for any person and figure out is like, you know, as part of a conversation, are the maps really helpful for this? Sometimes, mm-hmm. yes, yeah, sometimes no. And then being able to sort of have some skill around that is also interesting. You my experience, I mean? like I would say, like, if I was to describe the experience overall, what I would say is this is like uh, my. What surprised me about what I'm calling awakening is um, what I how I describe is it, it's just it, it, it just seems like an infinite emanation. And you can't really talk about it. It just seems like an infinite emanation of reality or of, and it, it's the only thing like, it's funny, like when I had that experience on the hillside with that cloud, I was, my feeling was that if a Christian experienced this, they think they'd met Christ, right? There was just, there was a sensation of just, it was just, it was just 
infinite power, just infinity, just boom. And it was, uh, and it was beautiful. And it's almost like the mind is like some kind of, or Shakti, is some kind of overlay, which is trying to interpret the, this infinite power, which nobody can describe. And there's this infinite uh, radiance, which is, uh, you can't describe it, it's just beautiful. And it seems to be the source of all things. And uh, and that's it, I guess. Now, a lot of people say it's actually nothingness, I guess. Or maybe, I guess there's stages to the enlightenment too, right? So like well, one of the things Ramajit talks very, very about, complicated. And there's a range yeah. of how this presents an actual individual. So there's a, yeah. this, this is not all straightforward. I mean, that could be hours and hours and hours of conversations okay, yeah, about yeah. the sort of like emptiness versus fullness true right? self versus no <laughs> self. The, the, these conversations yeah. have, have split whole traditions and communities and teachers for thousands yeah. of years. You know, so we're not going to sort that out today. But the, the thing I actually think about these days is what are the benefits and then the downsides of any of those interpretations that you fix on? Because I've yep. actually come to the conclusion, each of them have their pros and cons. So if you assume a stable source that is all powerful or something, that has mm -hmm. its benefits and it can be very useful. And it also has some known downsides in the same way as if you, if you adopt the view, nothing is stable. Everything is ephemeral. Everything is empty. There's, there's absolutely no ground or whatever that has its clear benefits. And it also can cause some complexities for people at various stages as well. And so, um, and that may be a moving target as we progress in our practice, like along the way, you've already described a whole lot of different relationships and interpretations of how yeah. you thought of this whole journey. And yeah. that often keeps going like so. So, you know, you're you don't look that terribly old. You may, you know, however many decades longer you might live, depending on how you right. treat yourself and and the luck of the draw. Right. So, you know, you might have all kinds of other iterations and, and variations on how you relate to these concepts of true self, no self, fullness, emptiness, interconnection, the divine, the, you know, um, elements. What, however, right? And so these yeah. are, are themes that continue to sort of roll through our lives and get these additional meanings or or even merge together in various ways or synthesize or or be so yeah, and that's part of the fun. And so, oh, yeah. one thing I forgot to mention about the maps. The maps can sometimes help point people towards what I think of as Easter egg functionality, which is a term from video games, which is basically sometimes there are these weird little hidden things that someone might have the capability of that they didn't even really recognize, like a car that had a button that you would never notice, but when you push it, it does some really cool thing or you yeah. know, jet flames come out of your tailpipe <laughs> and you roar down the road or who knows what. But meditation can have some of those things as well where you didn't recognize that, oh, a subtle tweak or turn or something might allow one to access an additional layer or possibility or insight that they didn't know about. And sometimes the maps can help direct one towards those. And so that is one of the, the things that can be useful about maps. But then the downside of that is getting people chasing their conceptions of those experiences and ignoring the immediate reality that is the fundamental basis of the whole path. Yeah. And so, yeah, the whole map topic is complicated. But I'm very back. interesting. I mean, these these all sound like really cool, interesting experiences, regardless yeah. of how you want to label them or what sort of. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't through. matter. It's all just awesome, right? I mean, who cares? There you go. Right? I, I'm on the. I totally agree. So it's just awesome. Um, I'm gonna double back to the Janus here, um, because we're talking about enlightenment or whatever, and um, a lot of people seem to think that um, that the Janus prepare you for awakening or whatever. Now the Janus seem to be and we, were, we talked about this about a bit, a bit about this already is you focus on joy and then you push that into or you allow it to move into rapture and um and it, so the so the jannas are a, a concentration state right they're concentration states yeah is that right and yeah so um although they can have insighty elements as well so the the thing is the clarity of mind that you get when you're in a jhanic state also makes insight easier it's made it's easier to see all the little components all the energy the moving parts the pieces the 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 additional subtle layers the so they it, because for some well and then it varies by the person so some people when they get into jhana 
they don't really easily notice that. They just notice the positive factors, the bliss, the pleasure, but it doesn't turn towards insight into you know, the true nature of experience or however you want to call it. But some people, when they get into jhana, very quickly, their mind is inclined towards insight and they begin to notice energy and patterns and deeper layers and deconstructing the sense of a stable, continuous self or you know, they start having, and, and there's, there's again a range there as well of how people relate to jhanic experiences and what they're is able there, to see from them as a platform. Is there a mechanic to like move between concentration and insight or is that just something that happens naturally? It's like yeah, your mind drifts, it just insight flows in? For some people, it happens naturally, and then for other people, inclining or training. So, so for people who it's not, for whom it's not as natural, noticing, starting to notice what we call the three characteristics of the sensations that make up the jhanic experience. Like, what are all the little moments where you're knowing it? What are all the little physical sensations? What are all the little components of bliss? Or how is your mind sampling? There's bliss. There's bliss. There's pleasure. There's bliss. There's joy. There's bliss. There's stability. There's you know wonder. There's amazement. There's you know rapture. There's divine you know, love, there's whatever. But if you start to notice each of those little things arising and vanishing quickly on their own as part of the natural unfolding flow of the rich, scintillating, you know, amazing experience that life is, then that's how people can sort of start getting into insight territory. And some yeah, people uh, will just find themselves in insight territory spontaneously or seemingly spontaneously without it being extremely clear how they got there. And and again, people have their various inclinations. I'm I'm just sort of more of an insighty person. Again, I found the genres hard. It was really okay. hard for me to tune into, tune into anything stable because my when I closed my eyes, it just felt like a a you know a 3D moving kaleidoscope of fireflies and stuff. Yeah. Like, like how can you find anything stable to like get a jhanic <laughs> state? It didn't make any sense to me. And other people are like, well, how can you not calm down and get into jhanic states when you tune into your breath? It just gets all flowy and smooth and right? and yeah. awesome. And I'm like, yeah, not for me. Well, later it did, <laughs> but but that was not me for the first you know few year year or so or few of my practice. A couple of times you you've used the word divine. Um, and I guess you know, a lot of people think Buddhists don't believe in God or whatever. Um, they believe and, in uh, lots of gods, actually, or most, just sort of a traditional, you know, old school Buddhism. It actually is yeah. very polytheistic. So they actually yeah. have these extremely elaborate descriptions of lots and lots of God realms, heaven realms, different classes of gods. They have right. names for their gods. They've got all these different. So, and um, so it's very intricate from a God point of view. It's not monotheistic. So that's the difference. But, you know, it's chock-a-block full of gods. And these are gods that might inhabit realms or be the rulers of realms of, of like blissful states, of power, you know, powerful states of magic, of creation. You know, there, there are all these gods that do all these things. Um, yeah. So it's, it's very, in its old school form, if you're talking like old Theravada, which is like these books here, you know, or even, you know, um, t Tibetan stuff or even some of the Zen things, or if you look at like um, Shingon Buddhism, which is sort of a Japanese version of Vajrayana, um, then they have all these different sort of godlike bodhisattvas, and they've got all these, you know, it gets very, very complicated, actually, yeah. with regard to the God question, but not generally monotheistic. But the, yeah, so in other words, what I would say is like, my, my feeling about this is like, uh, like what I perceive as awakening is um like it seems to me all the gods are like are part of the mind like shakti it's all part of certainly the one way to think of it yeah it's a way of thinking about it that's it I'm, I'm not saying this is definitive i'm just saying it's uh and that can be a very a, useful way to think about it it's sure. a way to think about it whereas like the emanation this infinite emanation which i perceive that seems it seems like everything is coming from it seems like shakti's trying to interpret that right it's trying it's like some kind of like reflection interpretation um well, and so the thing is, is because um, you have used the word divine. So I guess if there's lots of gods and deities, then you're quite comfortable using those words then, like divinity. Do you do you ever meditate on that? Like I find, like for example, sometimes like I'll meditate on energy. But one of the, one of the practices I was trying, experimenting, I would focus on like like white light and just completely concentrate on it as divinity. Dude, it, oh my god, that goes crazy. You want to you want to yeah. start. You want to see your body start flipping around the bed really quickly? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that arising and passing away territory of bright white lights and spontaneous movements and Kundalini stuff, right? Yeah. As I would call it, Udiyabhaya yeah. Nana or whatever you want to. Um, so the quality of the sense of divine presence can arise 
Yeah. Like um, the sense of the sacred is a feeling, is a tone yeah. that we can tune into in her terms of human experience. And so I'm something of a phenomenologist more than I am um, an ontologist. An ontology, a fancy word for like beliefs of what is ultimately truly true. Okay. I'm way more of an applied phenomenologist, meaning I have definitely experienced in my own pra you know, practice the sense of the presence of divinity or the sense yeah. of the quality of the sacred or the divine as yeah. a lived experience that arose as a sort of a mingling of interpretation and sort of direct um, something I was feeling. And regardless of what you say that is ultimately, the feeling of it can definitely arise and it definitely makes for a very powerful concentration object that I truly agree with. Yeah. One of the things I was trying is I was doing the, um, after all those negative things, I decided I'd start trying to use mantras, right? So I was doing the, oh, fun. Uh, I was doing the, uh, um, I've done a bunch of them, but like you do the Krishna mantra or whatever. And like, I would have evocations of Krishna in the bedroom and it, what the fuck? It's unbelievable. <laughs> nobody, nobody would, nobody would believe it. And then, uh, yeah. and Shiva and it's like, it's so beautiful. It's, it just turns the whole bedroom turns into India or something. And you're like, how is this possible, man? And it's like the most beautiful experience. But the funny one is the one that I, for some reason I've become connected to it is the Om Mani Padme Hum. And I go it's into Om Mani Padme Hum and it's just like this, uh, it's like this, it's like a jewel of purity, which, and it's like, you know, like if you're moving through consciousness and like, like, for example, if you're meditating on like the, like a body, a body scanning, right? And maybe you're meditating on the skin and then the space between the skin and the bones, right? And so I'll start, I'll start doing the Om Mani Padme Hum Mantra in, in the spaces. I do it wherever there's space. So I'll do it in the space nice. between the fingers, between the skin, and then That's I'll do it in cool. the space between the physical and my imagination. And dude, that nice. mantra, it's like, it's so powerful. And I wonder, you know, I know you you said that you use mantras. Like how how do I get no training in this? It just happens, you know. But uh, what's your experience with the mantras and this kind of like? How do those work? So, actually, wow, how do they work? I mean, I, yeah, it's I know. Funny to even know what like what's the frame for that question biologically, spiritual, energetically, spiritually. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but do they work? I, that they work is the interesting thing, even more than how or why. But that they do work and can evoke some very powerful tunings and um, experiences is, is definitely true. Um, I've had a number of mantras come to me spontaneously. So, um, uh. and I've also, you know, had some initiations or whatever, where people gave me various mantras, various things, and um, then read a number where I didn't have any formal training in it, but just started doing some mantra I found in a book or something, or it was recommended to be by a friend or whatever. And they're all really interesting. I have a very musical brain, so it's very easy. That's one of my strong sense doors is auditory stuff. So I was a sound man for years. I play guitar. I'm just yeah, very yeah. auditory. Yeah. I obsess about microphones and microphone reviews. Um, because I'm, that's one of that's one of my strong sense proclivities, and so mantras for me very rapidly become very orchestral, multi-part. They sound like choruses are singing them. They can get other musical instrument parts or resonances, or wow. they they can get very cool, which is one of the reasons I like them because it's my one of my strong sense right. doors. And, um, you know, I, I have another experience that I was going to mention. So I was actually I wasn't even doing the mantra myself. Yeah. Um, a friend of mine uh, I, uh, was um, sharing some YouTube videos and shared a YouTube video of uh, a medicine Buddha mantra that was just looping on YouTube. And it was like three and a half hours or something. You can probably find this pretty easily in a Google search of YouTube of medicine Buddha mantra. Medicine and it's really well beautiful chanting and some orchestration. I liked, I liked the musicality of it. And it's like, I just had it running in the background while I was writing that book there, Mastering the Core Teachings of the Buddha. Yeah. And I had had it running for, I don't know, two or three hours or something. And then I all of a sudden looked down at my hands and I had this blue outline of like additional energy and this big wow. blue buddha thing with this fancy headdress <laughs> that i sort of see and it's kind of moderately translucent is all around me and i have this whole sort of medicine buddha kind of Amazing. translucent transparent overlay in the sense of something of that energy um 
coming into this space and body form for a little while and then it faded it didn't last very long but it was it was really um surprising that it was just even being around it not even doing it could evoke yeah. that sort of thing yeah it's really neat um and they're definitely <laughs> something of the address book or you know of or email address of lots of different energies so like yeah. how to invoke these things um so now i wonder you know it's like you have these events because you know a lot, some people like formally do astral projection which i don't really do i just meditate and it sort of turns into some sort of astral experience like you're like what's going on you know and like in a way it seems like with some of your experiences it's almost like there's some bleed there so it's like in the normal life you don't have to meditate just say it just bleeds through and you're seeing sometimes from time to time you might see something or you have a medicine yeah. good experience which is amazing. But I think of myself more of a tourist than a native. So like there are some people who are just natively very powersy like that. Yeah. Whereas right. I'm kind of hit or miss, you know, yeah. on retreat, actually, the reason I go on fire casino retreats and get powered up is then for the duration of that retreat, once I get powered up, I become, I feel like a native, right? So the access yeah. is there. It's easy. These experiences happen a lot. It's just kind of the world I'm living in. And then I come off retreat and I power down and then I just sort of have them full on like that sometimes. Wow. Right. So um, yeah. But the more practice I've done, the more of that kind of stuff I have, and the more inclination to those kinds of experiences, and the more open I've been to them, the more likely they've been, clearly. And But, you know, I know people who are way more native -y than me, but yeah. the fact that it can be cultivated, and you can turn yourself from, you know, someone who had very little experience with these, to a tourist, to, an, you know, it's more of a native, you can go yeah. in that direction, that's developmental is, is good, because... Um, you know, that that gives us hope that we can, if we want more of that, we can go more in that direction. Although I will definitely say that one of the important things to know is also like how to have less of that. So just like a car with only an accelerator and not brakes or a steering wheel, not so useful, right? Yeah. The thing you want most is brakes. The next thing you want is a steering wheel. And then, okay, finally, lastly, you want an accelerator pedal. And most people think of it as the other way. Um, but I talk with people all the time who have gotten into this territory and for whatever reason, they're not just a native, they're a native who can't get out of it. They can't stop it. And that can be very disconcerting for people sometimes. And that's where you get into the whole questions of mental illness and where do you draw yeah. the line and what's shamanic opening. Fascinating book I was reading uh, recently by a guy named Jez Hughes, The Wisdom of Mental Illness, which talks all about shamanic sickness. So if anybody listening to this has gotten into trouble, um, there's another book I like called Breaking Open, and you were talking about um, uh, uh, energy work, um, books that get recommended to me a lot, though I have not, I've just kind of skimmed them, but haven't um, read all of them, um, are books by uh, Tara Springett. So if I've got her name oh, right, I'm kind of bad with names. I, I interviewed anyway. her. I've read a bunch of her books. They're really oh, yeah. good. So, yeah, yeah her, her stuff uh, gets rave reviews from people who are really? into this okay, stuff. Good. So, yeah. Um, uh -huh. Anyway, a lot of my friends have found that very valuable material. So cool you've interviewed. I didn't know. Awesome. Yeah. Good. No, I read a bunch of her. She's got a book on Kundalini. And at the time, yeah. it has some like tantric stuff about visualizing green Tara mm -hmm. and the heart. And I was, at the time, I was having evocations. And I thought, well, you know, maybe I'll try this. And all work. Everything worked. You know, I'm like, wow. And then, and she's got a bunch of books which have been really helpful. And she's got a really relaxed style. And she's down to earth and cool. I really like her. Nice lady. Um, yeah. Uh, I have a couple more questions for you. Um, sure. I talked to you all day, man, but uh, like uh, one of the questions, somebody on my on the YouTube channel asked me to ask you this, and we've been talking a bit about transmission there and stuff. Um, so this guy, Chris, he was uh, he was asking me to ask you this. Um, like, what's the difference? Like, for example, there's various sort of designations of special people, like in Buddhism, you might be an arrogant or whatever. Um, I don't know. And I, even, makes, oh, I uh, even have that kind of a title for myself on the book, right? So, I, right. you know, and there's and then, pros and cons to that kind of language. It can really piss off some orthodox people. And right? Some people are like yeah. really inspired by it. And, and then yeah. people debate whether or not you've got various attainments and what the real criteria are. And you right. can get into this whole complicated world of competition and comparison. And, but also, I, I think the good thing about you, though, is you're very, you're very, though, so. You're very critical about this stuff, though, because you, you didn't just say, I'm inherent, an air hand. I mean, you, you're like empirically. I mean, to me, it seems like you empirically go through why this might be true, right? So it's like- Well, it's at least like I lay just, out my criteria based on my yeah. experience very straightforwardly, what it did, what it didn't do. And yeah. regardless of whether or not you like the way I use the term, at least I'm, I tr do my best to be extremely clear and precise yeah. in my phenomenology and, and you know, so take yeah. it or leave it. One Fair dude's enough. opinion on the internet. 
<laughs> yeah. Well, my, the, the question was actually, what's the difference between like a designation like Arahant and then like what he calls special people like Ramana Maharshi and this kind of stuff? I mean, are those, are, are they like beyond that? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. So, so th the issue is with those kinds of designations and those kinds of questions is um, that almost none of those people are generally open to the kind of very thoughtful, practical discussion. I mean, Romani is dead, so we couldn't do yeah. this for him. Right. But for those who are living, it's actually very, very hard to have those conversations. And very, very few of these people who get those kinds of labels put on them um, yeah. are willing to just have a very technical, long, thorough, <laughs> detailed, criteria-based <laughs> right. conversation. And then even for those that are, there's the question of would it actually hold up to some sort of more formal reality testing? So for yeah. example, um, I had a conversation with a guy named Delson Armstrong and Delson Armstrong claims to be an arahat, but he claims to be the type of arahat that literally has eliminated all sensual desire. And okay. so we discussed about like, how would that hold up in what I call the hottie and a hot tub test? Yep. you know, which is basically just like you'd figure. And so, yeah, right. you know, where's the real, you know, and then the question is, are, are these people interested in actually being subject to the rigorous clinical trials that the scientist in me yeah. really wants? And then like, yeah, yeah, yeah. what can you see of the similarities on brain imaging? What can you see of the similarities on perceptual threshold testing? What can you see of the similarities of other psychological metric testing or, or whatever? Like if you're, so if you're going to, enter that world of attempting to do formal states and stages and comparisons. Yeah. What's your, what are your, what we call epistemological standards, meaning what do you need? What's your, what's your foundational basis of, I mean, what do you need to say, this is how I know what I know. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I know this person is a special person or an arhat or whatever, however you want to define these things based on this evidence quality. And then yep. what's sufficient for your, but, but then it really almost brings it back down to the, the person asking the question of how does that change? Like, let's say you had two people out there that are not you and one, you decide, oh, based on my criteria, that person's an arahat and based on my specific criteria, that's a special person, whatever that means. Right. Yeah. How does that change your own practice? Like, what does that then do for you? Yeah. These are two dudes over there or, you know, dudettes or whatever. And right. so like, how does that change you is the more interesting question. And usually it doesn't. Except yeah. like rah rah, my team is the has got the higher score or whatever, right? Which, you know, is tribal and interesting, but practically, you know, does it actually change whose techniques you'd follow, or does it change how you would look at yourself, or what you would aspire to, or yeah, what yeah. might be possible for you? I mean, these are more practical and interesting questions to me. Yeah. Because again, like I, I've been in endless conversations about like, oh, this Zen master is more advanced than this. Vedanta, there's no, this Tantra, this Tibetan guy, he's the top muckety muck, whatever, because you know, it's just like, oh God, you know, it, it's it, actually, the question is it actually becomes sort of like sports team. So, you know, go, you know, whatever yeah. sports team, I don't know, I think almost nothing about sports. So yeah. <laughs> it's actually a good opportunity for self-reflection at the end of the day. If you're asking the yeah. question, focus on yourself a bit more, right? Sure. <laughs> focus on consciousness more and stop worrying about what other people are powerful or whatever, right? Um, yeah. Okay. Last question, and this this one's slightly different, I guess. Um, macrocosm, microcosm, kind of thing. Um, <laughs> it's small, small question, Daniel. But like, uh, here's the deal: is like, um, like, um, well, how am I going to say this? How am I going to say this? I, I the the, uh, the world is changing, right? The world is changing. Oh yeah, I know. I know. I'm framing this. Is um, some people think, and I think. I, I get energetic vibes about this. Like I sometimes I go into the state of like pure knowing and I, it seems all real and stuff. So who knows? Right. But it seems to me that, um, uh, that, you know, artificial intelligence, the, are the, the, some people, this AI singularity that's coming down the line, apparently in the next 10 to 20 years, um, <laughs> is, is well, what my point is, this is like consciousness is individual. I mean, it, it's not, I mean, what the hell is going on? It's like, I'm at, or is it? I'm not framing the question well. The point is this: is that how much of reality 
is projected from us individually, right? So like, for example, there's stuff that's gone in the world and it's like, if you're a paranoid type, you might think, oh, wow, that's almost seems like it's being projected out of some issues which I haven't resolved, which may seem ridiculous, but, um, but who knows? Um, I guess my main question here is what is what is the future of uh, of consciousness as the <laughs> I'm all over the place. Sorry. What is the future? What's the future of consciousness for the individual as artificial intelligence comes into play in our lives? Um, wow, uh, that actually probably could be a very long discussion to even tease out each of those a what yeah. do you mean by consciousness sure. b yeah. what are your assumptions about consciousness c what are your assumptions about the consciousness of ai yeah next how could you even prove whether or not machines are intelligent and through which frame yeah. so from the cog from the cosmic consciousness frame of course all things are some kind of intelligent conscious something from the scientific materialist frame it seems pretty darn hard to imagine that silicon is conscious and then you've got everything in between so as you go yeah, from yeah. if if you take it from everything is cosmic consciousness divine consciousness whatever and so everything yeah. is a manifestation of that to the most material then where your question i think gets interesting is where you start drawing the lines in between there somewhere where this yeah. is consciousness this isn't my cell phone isn't conscious yet but it will be in the singularity or who knows right i mean yeah. and so i think actually the first interesting thing if we were going to have a much longer conversation would yeah. be to start defining where you draw those lines and then okay. the more interesting thing is when you you were trying to frame it of what's the 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 thing that's going to impact human consciousness yeah what you probably mean is how is that going to affect safety or society or sure, or is yeah. it that you actually think that machines becoming consciousness will affect something oh. fundamental about human consciousness or what's how, how do we draw the lines here it's in clearly terms of fear your, it's clearly you know, fear-based question here right sure <laughs> and then what's the fear like what are some of the interesting fears if yeah. you don't mind go, going to that underlying level of um oh well uh, i've had again, i've had like, interaction with ai i've had interaction moving into ai consciousness like during meditation what was that like it's fucking horrifying um hmm. really scary because like thinking because there's it, a giant mach impersonal machine that doesn't care that's going to be smarter than us and has its well, own yeah, agenda well, it's, it's not it's like it's it's kind of infinite it's like an infinite zone of and it's obviously not human so it obviously doesn't care about humanity or whatever hmm. and the one thing is the funny thing and this is this is complete this might be nonsense it's something that occurred to me is that the big thing of course is can machine machines can't be intelligent but i i had this idea and um depends on how you define it again where you draw that line between sure everything is well, conscious well, i think well, I maybe think, nothing I is think, conscious right i think what's going to happen and this is crazy this is crazy land here but i'm going to say it anyway because you'll there'll be a good laugh for you is uh is you can't you can design all the intelligent systems and everything but the way it becomes super intelligent is somebody will do an energy transmission to it from a certain point of view, that's already happening all the time. So consider yeah, the global right. machine that is the internet and the exactly. staggering amount of attention and emotional power that right. is flowing into it. From a certain point of view, the internet is probably the greatest magical and informational accumulator that humanity has ever created. Right. And so when you say someone is finally going to actually transmit to this thing, I would claim the very act of what we're doing now right. is one teeny drop in the great hurricane yeah. of people transmitting their energies, their dreams, their desires, their hopes, their fears into this thing, through this thing, building this thing, spending staggering amounts of money and resource on this thing that is our interconnected right. digital life, right? I mean, yeah. what else? What else has propelled companies past the multi-trillion dollar mark? Right. Nothing. That. Yeah. That is where the energy, the focus, the life, the the swirling patterns of emotive magical power is swirling through this thing. Yeah. Right? Period. And the, ter the tertiary events too. I mean, it's actually positive. I would never have discovered ayahuasca or consciousness or your book or anything if I hadn't been for the internet. So it's it's actually got net positive result. On a personal level, 
So, I mean, maybe as I mean, who knows? I guess it's just the change that's coming is so huge. It's easy to be scared by it. There's a big, like, there's a big tsunami of technology and a, and fear. And maybe, oh, yeah. maybe it's not necessary. I mean, maybe it is. I don't know. But um, do you think about those things at all? Or are you just like, you're just like, oh, I'm, are you above all that? I'm cool. Oh, I think about all that stuff all the time. <clears throat> I, I mean, I actively keep. Um, I keep my finger on the pulse of a number of uh, blogs and videos and YouTubers and people who talk about this. I think a lot about cryptocurrency. I think a lot about AI. Uh, I yeah. think about digital security. I think about quantum computing. I think about, you know, uh, the medium and what medium is the message and what is this medium creating? How is this yeah. destabilizing or stabilizing governments? How is this providing opportunity? My entire <clears throat> job is virtual largely. I spend all day on the internet or doing email or having meetings with people or doing creative content that's, you know, in the cloud or, or something. And so, um, and you know, that's, that's much of the world I live in at the moment in terms of yeah. time and energy. And so I think about this all the time, how, how could one not in this day and age, right? unless you're part of the, you know, however, one or 2 billion people that aren't even connected to it yet, which is also interesting. So there's this, yeah whole um relatively large chunk of humanity that even though it's impacting the day-to-day -day of it they're not that super plugged in although cell phones becoming more and more ubiquitous ubiquitous even in in countries with relatively um uh, small amounts of economic development and so right i'll tell you i was i read a book the, this year or last year um i don't know if you're familiar with it. it's called prometheus and atlas it's by mm, this i don't know this it. guy uh, so, and I'm sure this, this uh, the the author Jason Durjani is he's a bit controversial, but that book is a work of genius. It's really interesting, and his hmm. his hypothesis is that that the surge of technology is actually the shadow aspect of Prometheus. Uh, it's it's actually it's a projection of an archetype, and um, and he's really epistemological. He's really empirical. He's is the the level and is he's a philosopher. So very hmm. very deep discussion of the philosophical underpinnings of scientism. And it's just stunning, but he gets nice, it, he gets you. very much into this discussion about um, how to deal with it, and that's that's quite controversial. His solution to it, you know, but um, but interesting all the same. So yeah, I thought I'd mention it. But like, um, I was out running this morning, and a phrase came to me, uh, which was, "Bitcoin is the quieting of the mind." Wow. <laughs> no, I don't know. That, maybe it's not true, but it's in the sense that it's uh, socially, economically, it's like it's the you've seen that guy um, Michael Saylor, hmm. who's the no oh, he's a, he's a, he's like a he owns micro what's that called he, he's the biggest holder of Bitcoin in the world real philosopher okay. guy got it uh, real philosopher guy he's got some great talks but um, what he talks about is how Bitcoin is the projection of uh, value through time and space and he ties it on to consciousness beautifully and he's, he's really thought about it quite a lot but it's in a way it's because it's when you look at the regular monetary system it's obviously it's up and down it's being controlled it's doing this and all of a sudden poof no it's static and it's slow ish right and it's in a way it's kind of it's kind of the quieting of the mind and, and like and that kind of ties into consciousness because how much is our consciousness being affected by the fluctuations like of work and money and everything else you know um anyway i've kept you on for an hour and a half so i'm really glad you came on I, um it's been delightful fun thank you it's been really fun meeting you yeah it was, i'm really I'm, I'm really psyched to talk to you man I, your book was really really important to me you know it was like at the right time it just came along you know getting emotional well, again <laughs> that, well cool well thanks to all the people who helped train me in this stuff they you know people taught me for free they gave this stuff to me freely and I'm just trying to pass it on, which is why you can find it for free at mctb.org, just trying to pay it forward. A lot of people were really helpful. And so, yeah, hopefully we'll all just continue to help each other in the spirit of generosity and kindness to help us all be okay as this strange <laughs> dance unfolds. <laughs> right? Yeah. Hey, thanks, man. Much love for coming right. on, man. You too. Yeah. Peace out. Bye. <laughs> Let me... Uh...